Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is cerebral edema, hydrocephalus, raised intracranial pressure, and herniation. So why do we put all of these topics together? It's because cerebral edema and hydrocephalus can cause raised intracranial pressure, and raised intracranial pressure can push us towards herniation. In this video, I'll describe the pathogenesis of edema and hydrocephalus, and then compare and contrast the different types of herniation, as well as their clinical consequences. So cerebral edema is problematic because it's going to cause swelling of the brain. And when this happens, we're going to get increased intracranial pressure, and there is a limit to what the brain can do because it is bounded by the rigid calvarium. Now, there are two main types of cerebral edema. Uh, vasogenic edema, which is due to disruption of the blood-brain barrier, for example, what we can see in the necrotic tissue surrounding an infarct. Or it can be due to increased vascular permeability, so we can see this, for example, in the context of a tumor. Recall that when we get that neoangiogenesis as our tumor is growing, that those new blood vessels are leaky and poorly formed, leading to uh, vascular permeability. And both of these are going to lead to increased extracellular fluid. And because there are limited lymphatics uh, in the brain, we're going to have impaired fluid resorption. We can further classify this as being localized, for example, adjacent to a neoplasm, or generalized, for example, with global ischemic injury. Now, another type uh, of uh, edema is what is called cytotoxic edema, and this may be due to uh, some sort of metabolic derangement or a generalized hypoxic uh, or ischemic insult. And what happens in this instance is we're going to get uh, cell mem membrane injury. Uh, to uh, neurons, glial cells, and endothelial cells. And with this, we're going to get an influx of sodium, which is going to pull in water, and it's going to cause an increase in our intracellular fluid. Now, the consequences uh, of both of these uh, types of edema can be significant. Here uh, is an example of a brain at autopsy that shows the classic features of cerebral edema. So you can appreciate that the sulci are quite narrowed. They've been pushed together by these expanded gyri. And the gyri themselves have uh, lack their typical convex appearance because they've been pushed against that inner uh, table of the skull. If we were to do an MRI or a CT scan, we would also see compression of ventricular cavities. So that is one cause of intracranial uh, pressure increase. Now let's turn to hydrocephalus, which can also cause increased intracranial pressure. Before we do that, let's briefly review the normal flow of cerebral spinal fluid. So as you'll recall, your choroid plexus generates this fluid, which is going to circulate through the ventricular system and then enter the cisterna magna at the base of the brainstem, washing over our cerebral convexities, then being absorbed by our arachnoid granulations. So that is what happens in health. In hydrocephalus, we have an accumulation of excess CSF within the ventricular system. And the two uh, most common causes of this will be impaired flow or impaired resorption of CSF. Uh, we can also see uh, overproduction, and I'll talk about that in a moment. So in impaired flow, this is typically going to be due to some sort of blockage, perhaps by a tumor or uh, some sort of scarring uh, due to inflammation. And because we have this block, this is referred to as non-communicating hydrocephalus. So you have upstream uh, dilation of a ventricular system. When we have uh, impaired resorption of our cerebral spinal fluid, which we can see, for example, with meningeal inflammation, there is no blockage, and so this is referred to as communicating hydrocephalus. And then finally, we can see excess CSF due to overproduction, and this typically will be due to tumors of the choroid plexus. And as we are generating this excess CSF, this can lead to increased intracranial pressure and herniation. But before we go on to herniation, let's look at the findings in hydrocephalus. Uh, here you can see an, an imaging study of an individual uh, with hydrocephalus secondary to a medulloblastoma, which you can see here. Uh, this tumor is uh, blocking the uh, outflow of our CSF. Therefore, it is building up here, and you can see it in the lateral ventricles, and there's even a little bit of leakage of this fluid into the periventricular space uh, due to this increased pressure. Uh, here's another example. This is an obstructive uh, hydrocephalus due to a viral uh, infection that obliterated the cerebral aqueduct. And again, you can see here just how enlarged the lateral ventricles are. Uh, we can see uh, something that is 
also a little bit similar to this, which is uh, hydrocephalus ex vacuo. That is what we see uh, when we have atrophy of the brain, uh, typically in uh, older individuals. And then we just have this uh, filling up of the space with cerebral spinal fluid because uh, we have that excess space within uh, the brain uh, case within the skull. So what is the problem with increased intracranial pressure? Well, the brain has a limited capacity to accommodate this increased intracranial pressure. Furthermore, we get this, uh, uh, this uh, vicious cycle where with this increased intracranial pressure, we're going to get compression of our vessels. That's going to cause decreased perfusion, which can lead to ischemic injury, which can lead to edema, which is going to contribute to increased intracranial pressure. So uh, how do you recognize patients who have increased intracranial pressure? Uh, so they uh, may describe having headache, uh, nausea, or vomiting. On fundoscopic exam, uh, you may notice papilledema, which is uh, swelling of the optic disc due to the uh, pressure uh, behind the eye. Now, how do you make the diagnosis? Uh, based on a neurological exam, you can do a spinal tap to assess pressure. Uh, you can also see uh, findings based on CT and MRI. And with this increased intracranial pressure, we have the risk of herniation. Now, herniation is the displacement of brain tissue past our rigid dural folds, so the falx and the tentorium, or through openings in the skull due to increased uh, intracranial pressure. Uh, and this is, uh, this is going to be a mass effect, which can either be a diffuse, which we see in generalized brain edema, or focal, for example, with tumors, abscesses, or hemorrhage. So I'd like to just describe for you the three types of herniation, and then we're going to go through each of these in detail. So let's begin by reviewing a little bit uh, of our anatomy. We have our falx cerebri right here at the uh, midline. Uh, we have our tentorium uh, here, separating our cerebrum from our cerebellum. And then we have our, tons our tonsillar herniation co can go through the foramen magnum. So let's begin uh, with our subfalcine uh, herniation. Uh, so what we have here is that the cingulate gyrus, which is this little guy here and right here, is going to be displaced under the falx. Uh, and this is typically going to be due to some sort of a unilateral or asymmetric uh, expansion. So for example, a tumor. Uh, and with that expansion, we're going to get pushing across here. And when we have this happen, we can get compression of the anterior cerebral artery, which will lead to contralateral lower extremity weakness and urinary incontinence. So let's take a look at what we can see grossly. Uh, this is an individual who has had uh, a uh, subfalcine herniation, also referred to as a cingulate herniation because this is the cingulate gyrus. And you can see here, this is where the lesion is, uh, perhaps some sort of diffuse astrocytoma, which has pushed the brain so that the uh, cingulate gyrus has gone underneath the falx. A couple of other uh, findings here is that we have compression here of our lateral ventricles. And when we do this, we can actually get some ob obstruction, which can cause hydrocephalus, which you can appreciate uh, here in the temporal lobe. Now, the next type of uh, uh, herniation I'd like to describe is transtentorial uh, herniation. And there's a lot going on here. So here, remember, is our uh, tentorium uh, right here. Uh, and what we see in transtentorial herniation is that the medial uh, temporal lobe right here or right here will be uh, displaced under the free margin of the tentorium. Now, the first thing that you'll, you will see when this occurs is uh, we're going to get third cranial nerve uh, compression, which can lead to ipsilateral pupillary dilation. Uh, we can also get compression of the posterior cerebellar artery, which can lead to infarction of the uh, visual cortex in the occipital lobe or uh, infarction of the temporal lobe. Now, uh, with continued pressure, uh, we're going to move beyond simply uh, pupillary dilation, uh, and we're going to impinge on the ocular uh, function that is uh, controlled by the third cranial nerve. We'll talk about that uh, in, a, in a couple of slides. And also with uh, progression of this herniation, as this tissue moves uh, through uh, the, the tentorial uh, notch here, it's going to push uh, the cerebral pedicle, uh, which will then uh, uh, can be impinged upon by the opposing or the contralateral uh, tentorium. Uh, and the uh, finding here, this groove is referred to as a Kernahan notch. And the important thing here is that this pressure is going to cause ipsilateral hemiparesis.
Now this is what we call a false localizing sign because typically because of our decussation here, if you have a lesion uh, on the, for example, on the right side of, of the brain, you're going to uh, notice this with uh, hemiparesis on the left side of the body. But because uh, we have this pressure here on this opposite side, it's going to be ipsilateral. Also with this uh, continued pressure, we can get occlusion of the aqueduct of Sylvius leading to hydrocephalus. I think that this image really puts uh, all of the clinical findings together in a really beautiful way. Uh, so here we see this is an individual with a subdural hematoma, uh, which is uh, as the uh, this is the, uh, um, the as the herniation occurs, we're going to get occlusion of a posterior cerebral artery, which can lead to an occipital lobe infarct, and we're also going to get pressure here on our third cranial nerve. That's going to cause uh, this ipsilateral uh, dilated pupil. Uh, and again, we can get some obstruction that's going to lead to hydrocephalus, which we can see here. So let's take a look at what we can see uh, in a brain at autopsy. Uh, here uh, we can see our cerebral peduncles. This is our cranial nerve three. And this groove here, which is a little difficult to see, is uh, from the uh, tissue that is being pushed under the tentorium. So the tentorium was on this side here. Uh, now, as I mentioned, we're going to get uh, ipsilateral uh, pupillary dilation. Uh, we get this dilation because the parasympathetic uh, nerves are on the periphery of cranial nerve three, so that's your first sign. But as we continue to uh, put pressure on this nerve and it becomes dysfunctional, we're going to get ocular paresis. So all of the uh, eye muscles that are innervated by cranial nerve three uh, will uh, become paralyzed. And the only ones that will work will have our lateral rectus, which is supplied by cranial nerve seven, and the superior oblique, uh, which is supplied by uh, cranial nerve four. And because they have no opposition from the muscles from cranial nerve three, we're going to get a down and out deviation of the eye. Now, another finding that we can see in a transtentorial uh, uh, herniation is that as the brain is pushing through, we can get tearing of uh, penetrating veins and arteries of the upper brain stem, and they're going to cause uh, secondary hemorrhage in the midbrain and pons. This is a you know pathognomonic finding here. You can see these flame-like uh, hemorrhages here, and this is referred to as a deray hemorrhage. So the last uh, type of herniation I'd like to describe is the tonsillar herniation. And this is when we get displacement of the cerebellar tonsils into the foramen magnum. Now this is uh, life-threatening because uh, with brainstem compression, uh, we can get damage to the respiratory and cardiac centers in the medulla. Uh, so here we can see uh, the cerebellar uh, tonsils being pushed through the foramen magnum. Uh, here is a gross uh, specimen. Again, a little bit difficult to see in this figure, but easier to see when you uh, have uh, the actual specimen. You can see this groove here in our cerebellum. Here's another groove here as these cerebral tonsils were pushed through uh, the foramen magnum. So just to finish up, here is just to remind you, these are the three uh, types of herniation that we just discussed. Uh, so obviously, we really don't want our patients uh, to herniate uh, because it has uh, catastrophic consequences. So when you uh, note that a patient has symptoms suggestive of increased intracranial pressure, it's time to start thinking about how to treat that. So uh, one possibility uh, that is important is to treat the underlying cause. Uh, so this can be infection or tumor, but also it could be in the case of a subdural hematoma, uh, you may wish to evacuate that blood, uh, which will uh, give more space for the brain uh, to move into. There are also medications that we can use to reduce swelling. We might uh, drain uh, excess cerebral spinal fluid. And then in some instances, we'll actually remove a portion of the skull, uh, which is referred to as a craniotomy so that the brain can swell uh, into that area. As always, uh, here are some uh, questions uh, to uh, help you review the material we've just discussed. I hope you have found this useful. Thank you very much for your time and attention.